Sweet. Kierkegaard noted, no grand inquisitor has in readiness such terrible tortures as his anxiety. No spy knows how to attack more artfully. No sharp-witted judge knows how to interrogate. To examine the accused as anxiety does, which never lets him escape. Neither by diversion nor by noise, neither at work nor at play, neither by day nor by night. I would add that anxiety is an expert strategist. At the same time it attacks us, it works to eliminate our connections with those around us. This is a good strategy because it is our connections with those around us, the groups we belong to, that bolster our resilience. The number of groups we belong to not only bolsters our resilience, it is also protective against developing depression, can be curative of existing depression, and helps to prevent depression relapse. Even when we're old, groups are critical. The more groups we belong to, the slower our cognitive decline, because yes, it does decline, and the quicker our recovery from conditions such as stroke. Findings like these have contributed to an idea known as the social cure. I only came to know the importance of groups when I eliminated all the groups that I belong to. It started in my first year at university. Having failed high school, I was anxious to pass. First year was good. I passed with a mix of C's and B's. I wanted to do better. I needed more time to study. So in second year, I no longer had time to hang out with my mates. One group down, not a big deal. In second year, I got a mix of A's and B's. All of a sudden, it felt like this wasn't good enough. I felt like I was failing. I needed to do better. So at the start of third year, I quit rugby. A second group down. Again, this wasn't good enough. I still felt like I was failing. So I cut my family off. My anxiety controlled me. Anytime I wasn't studying, my head was filled with noise about being a failure, about not working hard enough, about not having what it takes to succeed. In third year, my anxiety extended its focus to my physical appearance. I became bulimic. I was regularly binging and making myself throw up. I was getting up at 6 a.m. to go for runs, getting to the library before it opened at 8, studying until it closed at 11, and then cycling home. I kept the schedule seven days a week using the 24-hour computer labs when the library was not open. Before the year was out, I had dropped 25 kgs. I was admitted to hospital, and I did not make it through my exams. In fourth year, it got worse. Now I was waking up between 3 and 4 a.m., studying until 6 a.m., getting to the library before it opens at 8, studying until it closed at 11, and then cycling home. I held hope that at the end of fourth year, my anxiety would abate that without any more study and exams to worry about, I would return to normal. I told myself that if my anxiety did not pass, I would end my life. The anxiety did pass, but only to make way for depression. Eliminating all those groups had created a hole, and now, without study and exams to fill it, depression did. That was when I first got help. That was also when I started the process of re-establishing those connections that I cut. At least in my case, I don't think maintaining those connections would have prevented me from developing anxiety and depression, but I definitely think that would have reduced their impact. I would have been more resilient. If we fast forward to today, I am now a lecturer in the Department of Psychology at the University of Otago. The professors that lectured me during my undergraduate degree are now my colleagues. They are one of my new groups and a group I feel a strong sense of belonging to. My undergraduate experience has now framed my research on belonging and resilience in adolescence. Our, rather than my research, might be a better term. I'm doing this along with my colleague and mentor, Dr. Jackie Hunter. One could say Jackie and I have formed a group, a small group, just two people, really the minimum one needs for a group, <laughs> but a group nonetheless. There are a number of reasons we chose to focus on adolescence. Psychological morbidity is high in New Zealand adolescents. Suicide accounts for approximately a quarter of adolescent deaths. Approximately one in five adolescents will experience depression. Even in the absence of mental anguish, adolescence is a time of biological, emotional, and social change that can present a number of challenges for adolescents to overcome, not least of which is the transition to university. An example of our research is the work we do with the spirit of adventure trust who run the well-known voyages on the spirit of New Zealand, a 45-metre, three-masted sailing ship. A 10-day voyage, 40 adolescents who don't know one another prior to, to participating, no showers, 
but daily 6 a.m. swims around the boat. No label clothing, no technology. That means no iPhones, no tablets, no laptops. I wonder whether many people here could survive. Building a group of people that support one another is the thesis of the voyage. The aim is to have adolescents learn how to run the ship themselves. Initially, the crew take a hands-on approach, but over the course of the voyage, they gradually adopt a hands-free policy, as the trainees learn every task required to run the ship, from cooking meals to navigation. It's obviously challenging for the trainees. They are away from home, away from comfort. There is little privacy on the ship, sleep is impacted. But the group provides the balance, that social support, that sense of belonging. We measure trainees' resilience scores one month before the voyage, the first day of the voyage, the last day, and then nine months after that. On the last day, we also measure the degree to which trainees identify with their new group and the sense of belonging to that group. These might seem very similar, but we think they represent an important distinction. During my undergraduate degree, I could have identified as a student. That could have been one of my groups. But I didn't feel like I belonged at university. Due to a number of factors, such as failing high school or sitting at parent-teacher interviews in year 12, or my English teacher told my parents that rather than return for year 13, I should probably start working on the wharf. So these things meant that I didn't feel like I belonged. So with respect to the trainees, we wanted to see whether their sense of belonging, separate from them identifying with a new group, uniquely contributed to their resilience. Resilience scores were no different on the first day to when they were when we measured them one month before. On the 10th day, however, participants' resilience scores had significantly increased. Critically, this increase was maintained at the nine-month time point. What's driving this? The adversity experienced on the voyage has long passed. I'm pretty sure trainees were not continuing to forego showers and technology. At least with respect to showers, for the sake of the parents, I truly hope this was not the case. What was driving this maintenance was their sense of belonging. Not simply the fact they identified with the new group, but how connected, included, and accepted they felt by the group. This is the power of groups. This is the power of the social cure. We commonly hear that we should not smoke, that we should exercise, that we should eat healthy, but we're never given guidelines about groups. Although a little morbid, a group of researchers actually compared how our chances of mortality decrease as we address a number of these factors in our lives. Surprising to many, perhaps the researchers themselves, building social relationships Having high rather than low social support has a comparable impact on decreasing mortality as a moderate smoker quitting smoking, and exceeds well-known factors such as increasing physical activity and eating healthy. Perhaps our doctors should be asking us about the number of groups we belong to. Belonging being the operative word, because again, it was individual subjective experience of being part of a group that held the most explanatory power. As scientists, we tend towards objectivity. We would lean towards simply counting the number of groups an individual belonged to. But in doing this, we miss what is most important. The individual sense that they are accepted by other group members and whether they truly, truly feel like they belong to the group. To close, I'll finish with a quote from Lincoln Park. From Kierkegaard, for those familiar with him, to Lincoln Park, we have clearly come full circle. To quote, I want to heal, I want to feel like I'm close to something real. I want to find what I've wanted all along, somewhere I belong. While you may not be a fan of their music, the lyrics reflect the research. The need to belong is a fundamental human motivation. Fundamental because it's a need, not simply a want. Fundamental because it appears finding somewhere we belong is critical to our mental health, physical health, and resilience. I am thankful every day that I have found it. Thank you for your time.